Second reading is from the 26th chapter of Matthew, 22nd, verses 36 through 40. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. May the Lord bless the reading of his word today. We have been spending the last few Sundays in the midst of a sermon series on the Bible. We started, if you recall, with what the Bible is. We then looked at things we ought to consider while we're reading the Bible. And then last Sunday, we looked at what the Bible doesn't say. We talked about those phrases that people say to one another um, that sound an awful lot like Scripture, but they're not scriptural. Things like everything happens for a reason, and it's all part of God's plan, and God won't give you more than you can handle. God helps those who help themselves and love the sinner and hate the sin. So now we're ready to move on. Uh, and look further into the Bible and focus on some things that are in the Bible. And today we're looking at the Ten Commandments. You've probably seen those um, displayed in churches, on courthouse lawns, on plaques hanging in your grandmother's house. Can you go one more slide forward, Ken? And I remember this thing hanging in my grandma's house. Anybody remember one of those? Maybe you have one in your house. And you're not a grandma. That's perfectly fine in the day too, of course. Uh, you can go back now. I just found that. And I thought, I remember that hanging in my grandparents' home. Uh, maybe if you have a weird sense of humor like me, you remember the movie History of the World Part 1 uh, with comedian Mel Brooks dressed as Moses carrying down from the mountain three stone tablets with the 15 commandments of God and he slips and, and, and he drops one and breaks it and then he announces the 10 commandments. Um, maybe you memorized the 10 commandments when you were young. Could you have looked them up today had I not shown them to you on screen um, where they appear much wordier than, of course, the ones you probably memorized if you did or you remember. Uh, for sure, the Ten Commandments hold a special place in the hearts of Christians and Jews as well. Um, some people go absolutely ape uh, when you start talking about removing the Ten Commandments from courthouse lawns. And so those same people would go ape if, if they were to put another religion's faith commandments on the lawn. Um, so that just kind of gives you an idea of how important we all find them to be. And they are a good starting place, of course, if you're seeking to live as a faithful follower of God. Those Ten Commandments are a really good place to start. Um, you're probably most familiar with them in this form, and I'm going to read them in the Old English because that's how I remember them. That's how they appeared on Grandma's plaque and on her wall in her house. Uh, maybe you remember them this way too. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not worship any graven image. Thou shalt not take God's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. Some lists have the no gods before me and the no graven images parts combined as the first commandment together, and, and the thou shalt not covet part broken into wife and goods, but either way, you come up with ten. Generally, you come up with ten. Do those sound familiar to you? Maybe you've noticed, or maybe you once were told, that in, in, in the, well, for instance, the first version that I gave you, that I read through, that those first four commandments are all about how to love God, and the back six are about how to love your neighbor. St. Augustine summed up the whole thing by saying, love God and do as you please, which sounds like 
do whatever you want after that. But his point was, if, if you really are about the business of truly loving God um, properly, then you're going to naturally do the right thing when it comes to others. And you're going to love others out of your love for God. So, um, you know, if, if I truly love God, then I'm not going to be putting other gods before him. I'm not going to make graven images, and I'm not going to take his name in vain. And if I truly love my neighbor as myself, then I'm not going to steal from my neighbor, and I'm not going to lie about or to them. I'm not going to covet their belongings, and I'm not going to have an affair with my neighbor's spouse, and I'm not going to kill or dishonor my neighbor or my parents for that matter. And when you sum it up like that, you may notice then that it sounds awfully familiar to an answer that Jesus gave to a certain question, which we'll look at here momentarily. Uh, some of the things that you maybe didn't know about the Ten Commandments, they are given twice in the Bible, as we understand it, um, and, and commonly in two different places, Exodus 22 through 17, which you heard uh, read to you today, and Deuteronomy 5, 6 through 21. It's there that we get a list of ten commandments, depending on which ones you lump together, as I pointed out, that God wrote down from Moses on Mount Sinai. And the Jews called this the covenant. But then, if you go flip, uh, if you find them there in Exodus 20, if you go on up to Exodus 34, um, after the first set of tablets are broken, um, you know, Mel Brooks dropped one in that movie, but, but in actuality, Moses threw them down. He was very upset when he caught the Israelites worshiping a golden calf when he was just up there talking to God. So uh, he returns to the mountain and God writes them down again, says he's making a covenant with Israel, but then gives what seems to be a different commandment list that contains the following. No worshiping other gods. That's the same, right? Make no treaties with foreign nations and take no wives from foreign nations. Is that one or is that two? No making of idols. That's the same as the earlier set. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread. First offspring of every womb belongs to the Lord. Do not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Remember the Sabbath. That's from the original list too. Celebrate the festival of weeks. Do not offer a blood sacrifice mixed with yeast. And don't let the Passover sacrifice remain until morning. Bring your first fruits of your labor to the house of the Lord. Do not, here's, I've been mentioning this for a few weeks, do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. Now, I don't know if you were counting all those, but I don't know if there's ten or if there's more than that there. But, and, and are these ten commandments again, or are they like a ritual code that goes along with those previous ten commandments? Scholars debate such things. But I've been wanting to talk about this for a while. Now, what is with that commandment? Don't cook a baby goat in its mother's milk. What is that? What, was that a thing back then? Um, and, and that commandment, actually, is where the Jewish kosher custom of preparing dairy and meat items separately, that's where that comes from. Um, I've read, actually, about this a little bit, and some scholars believe that that was a Hebrew metaphor sorts. So if you hear, if you ever hear such things as don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, things like that, it was sort of that kind of a thing. Which I think makes more sense, I hope, than a literal interpretation of don't cook a baby goat in its mother's milk. I, I don't know about you, but, but I, I can say that that's one I could follow. I don't intend to do that. I don't do that. <laughs> baby goats. I don't think that's how I want to think to cook it. <laughs> but these commandments um, are, are, are not easily followed. You, some of them are, like that one would be pretty easy, right? But, but you've probably noticed in your own personal experience, right, that these commandments are not easy to follow. Some of them are, yes, but some of them are not. Because how many of us would admit that we have missed an opportunity or two to tell the truth? And haven't we all looked at something that somebody else had and wished we had it? Haven't we all taken something that wasn't ours 
And that can happen pretty easily. You go to a store and they're ringing stuff up and maybe they miss something and you don't realize it until you go home or maybe you never realize it. What about that commandment for getting, for, uh, forbidding the worship of other gods? We can say we don't do that, but can we all admit that there are times when sometimes we put something above God? Even if it wasn't a physical idol that we bowed down to and worshipped. And then, if you were Jewish, a whole bunch more commandments were added in Leviticus chapters 17 through 26. A holiness code that was given to Israel to live under. When you add them all up, guess what? You get 613 commandments. A side note, how many of you have heard of the author A.J. Jacobs? Have you heard of this author? He wrote a book back in 2007 of his experience of trying to live out literally every commandment in the Bible. It was titled, The Year of Living Biblically, One Man's Humble Quest to Follow the Bible as Literally as Possible. And so he tried to do that. He tried to obey all 613 commandments, including stoning adulterers, which you wouldn't think that he would run into, but he actually did. One day, if I'm recalling the story properly, he was in a park, and he's dressed biblically, so he's sticking out like a sore thumb, thumb and then a guy came up to him, an older gentleman, and asked about why he's dressed that way, and so he begins to tell them, well, I'm writing a book, and I'm trying to live biblically for a year. And the guy offered the information himself. He said, well, I'm an adulterer. Are you going to stone me? So he reached into his pocket, he had some little stones, and he threw them at the guy. It went over about as well as you think it would. <laughs> he did things like blowing a shofar at the beginning of each month. Imagine what the neighbors thought of that, if, and, and, and not trimming the corners of his facial hair, things like that. He tried to live that way for an entire year. And then what about us today in the modern day? For even for us Christians, aren't there those other commandments out there that seemingly get elevated to the Big Ten? Maybe you've run into these yourself, such as thou shalt not drink alcohol. Have you ever known anybody that thought that any alcohol of any sort was wrong? What was Jesus doing at the wedding of Cain and Galilee if he was changing water into wine? But that's... That's a rule that gets elevated sometimes to, to the level of the Big Ten for some people. What about this one? Thou shalt not smoke, thou shalt not dance, thou shalt not play cards, thou shalt not listen to rock and roll music, thou shalt not play drums in church or guitars in church. What on earth did people do prior to the organ being invented? I don't know. Thou shalt not watch TV. I have a very good friend that grew up not watching television because her family believed that you couldn't do that. Thou shalt not watch R-rated movies. Thou shalt not buy a car on Sunday. We still got that one, right? Thou shalt not divorce. Thou shalt not have sex before marriage. The list goes on and on and on. And it gets harder and harder to not only know what those commands are, but to follow them all. And we try to do what is right, and we keep making it harder and harder on ourselves and others. But do you know who made it really easier than, 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 and actually made the list shorter instead of longer? It was Jesus. Jesus did that, actually. We find that in Matthew 22, as we've heard read earlier. It's still on screen. You can find it in Mark 12, 28 through 34, and Luke 10, 25 through 37, variations of the same thing. Jesus was asked a question by one of the experts of the Ten Commandments and all the others with it. He came up to Jesus and he said, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, how do you answer such a thing? Because Jesus would have known too, there's... 613, he didn't say which of the 10, he just said, which is the greatest commandment? So you, he's, you know, how do you even answer something like that? And, and Jesus answered very simply and very profoundly when he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. 
All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Mark adds another verse after it when he says, and I don't, and I can totally understand where he was coming from. No one dared ask him any more questions. That's pretty simple, isn't it? You know, all these commandments, be it 10 or 613, it comes down to these two that are so closely linked, it's as if they're one together. Love God and love me. Everything else hangs on it. Everything else is fulfilled by it. Can it be that simple? Jesus says yes. Yes, it can be. Because if we truly love God, then we will love the people God loves. And God loves all people. He loves them all. And if we love people, then we won't do wrong by them. And we won't harm them. And we won't be doing all those things that, that, that are negative and, and wrong, and we'll be doing it out of our love for God. And, and, and so yes, Jesus makes it simple. The other thing is that we need to remember today too is Jesus gives us the grace to follow these commandments. Here's one thing I can say from personal experience, and I have a hunch that you can say it too, it's not possible to follow all these commandments perfectly. And I don't care if you give me 10 or 613. I don't care if you only give me two. I'm still going to mess up at it. But thank God Almighty, the one who in Matthew 5.17 said he came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Praise God Almighty, he did what he, we could never do. What I could never do and what you could never do. He lived a life under the law that we could not without sin. And then he laid down his own life to fulfill the law for us. Before we ever came to faith in him. For that action that he did on our behalf. That's called grace. That is called grace. That's God's unmerited love and favor for us. For me and for you. And on top of that grace... There's grace made available to come to faith and to have faith. And from there, the grace to follow these commandments because the love of God is present in our lives. There's grace to tap into in order to obey. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. You have the grace of God present in you to lead you and to strengthen you. And to help you to follow, we can love God because God's love and grace is present within us. And we can love our neighbors for the same reason. God's love and grace is present within us. You and I couldn't stand a chance to do otherwise were it not that we have that grace. Now we have the chance to be able to do it. Praise the Lord. Now here's the thing. When you have faith in God through Jesus Christ, you and I, we have the grace necessary to obey and follow His commandments, but there's no guarantee that we will because why? We still have free will. We still have a choice to do the right thing, don't we? 1 Corinthians 10, 13, the Word says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out and you can endure it. That grace, again, is there. But so is free will. And even sometimes with God's grace available, we still fail, don't we? Sometimes we choose the wrong thing. Sometimes we fail to uphold what He would have us to do. But there is good news. And the good news is Jesus gives us grace when we fail to follow those commands. When we do fail, there's still grace there. There's grace for forgiveness. Grace when we repent and we ask Him to forgive us when we do fail. The Word tells us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's grace, again, to help us get back up again and continue to live into obedience once more. We all fail, don't we? Amen. Romans 3.23 says there's no difference between Jew and Gentile for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But it goes on to say 
And all are justified freely through His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. So the one who did not sin under the law laid down his sinless life in exchange for ours to cleanse us and to wrap us up in His own righteousness. So the law and our failure to uphold the law of God which we all are guilty of, ought to lead us to a few thoughts. Number one, we need God's grace. Amen? Oh, how we need it. And secondly, His grace is sufficient for all our sins. And, and when we realize this and we ask Him for that grace, it's His exceeding pleasure to give it to us in abundance so that we can get back up and carry on after we fall and lean into that grace at work in us turn away from our failures and strive to do better next time. If we have some takeaways today, may it be that rather than add to the Big Ten, like some people tend to do, may we take seriously what Jesus said was the greatest commandment and the other like it. Make it simple. Make that our focus. Love God. Love your neighbor without forgetting how wide the Lord's definition of our neighbor is. And believe it when he says it, that if we really do work at those two, we will fulfill all the rest. Let those commandments be your guide as you live your life of faith. And, and when we do that well, we stand as, a, as an example to others that don't have that same aspiration to live by. But also let those Ten Commandments lead you to a deeper understanding of God's grace, your own need for it, and also others' need for it. Grace to follow, grace for forgiveness, grace to get up and start over again. May it be so in us, in all God's faithful said. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Most Holy One, we thank you for your word to us today, including your commandments, the ten, and all the rest, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that, that you simplified things for us when you said that all the rest hang on and are fulfilled by two. Love you, God, with all our mind, body, and strength, and love our neighbors as ourselves. Give us not only the strength and determination and the power and the blessing to follow your commandments, but also the grace for we surely need it. And when we fail, as we humans do at times, please grant us the grace to be forgiven and reconciled to you so we can get back up after our fall, start following you in obedience once more. All this we pray in the high and holy name of love and grace, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.